First, I'm pretty sure many of you, I've thought this for many years, many of us think of a prodigal as somebody who just like walks away from the faith, stops coming to church, stops doing certain things, praying, and they like run away from God. Now that is a type of prodigal, which we're gonna see in the Bible, but what about those of us who are actively involved in ministry? Those who pray every day, those who get in the word, who do devotionals every day, right? Those of us who maybe serve in kids ministry or love of love or whatever it is that we do, what about us? And that's where the prodigal heart comes in. So here's a definition that I wrote um, and I wanted to share it with you. So a prodigal heart is a heart that does not trust the Lord, but relies on anything or anyone for comfort, strength, or happiness. So I'm going to say it again. A prodigal heart is a heart that does not trust the Lord, but relies on anything or anyone for comfort, strength, or happiness. So what are the signs of a prodigal heart? Number one, I'm going to give you guys a lot of lists. Number one, entitlement and pride. So you're basically saying at a certain point, you're just like, you know what? I've got this. I'm going to figure this out on my own. God, I'm fine. And that's sometimes where we see people walk away. But even in the middle of, of serving or being in ministry, or even just even reading your word, you think you've got it and your pride kicks in. So entitlement and pride comes in and you stop leaning on God and you start leaning on self. So that's the first sign of a prodigal heart. Number two is isolation slash alienation. So there's a difference between wanting to get along with the Lord and isolating yourself from the Lord. So I, I've heard, and I've done this myself, it's like, I just want to be alone. I just get, Leave me alone, get away from me. But you're not getting along with the Lord, you're kind of just pushing everybody away. And what that looks like is there's no community, there's no accountability, there's no or there's a lessened amount of church attendance, or there's no Bible study, prayer, or there's a lessened amount. Now, now granted, we have seasons where we can get busy, right? And things can come up and it becomes a little bit more difficult. But again, this is a sign of falling into a prodigal, having a prodigal heart, isolation and alienation. Number three, no conviction for sin. So if you isolate and you have pride, then you have no accountability. So if I have no community, then I have no accountability. So you're very likely to fall into further sin. And the first sin to begin with was just walking away from God and not trusting him. And then the fourth one is deeper sin. So one sin leads to another, it has this domino effect. And having a prodigal heart can lead you to dark places that you never thought you would be in. So one sin can lead to a deeper sin. So I'll repeat the four. Number one was entitlement and pride. Two was isolation and alienation. Three was no conviction for sin. And four was deeper sin. So if we're looking at Genesis 4, we're going to be talking about the story of Cain and Abel. And if you've never read this story before, Cain and Abel are brothers. They each bring offerings to the Lord. And we see how they were both doing what God commanded them to do. And this is where we're serving, right? For those of us who serve consistently, who are in ministries, who are leaders, this is where the story can come in really quickly for us. But one of them had a heart that was off. So we're going to read. We're going to start at verse 1. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Then she bore again, this time his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought all the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. Verse 5 says, and Cain was angry and his countenance fell. So the first thing we begin to see here is a little bit of entitlement and pride creeping in. Because he's angry and his countenance falls. So he knows that it wasn't acceptable. Like he, it wasn't an acceptable sacrifice to the Lord. And he's upset about it. Verse 6. So the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door and its desires for you. But you should rule over it. I remember the first time I read this story years ago, uh, and we're going to talk about our perception of God. I thought God was kind of like yelling at him. Why are you upset? Don't you know? 
But then you realize, as you really read into it, you look at it, he's encouraging him. And he's, so God encouraged Cain and told him, like, if you do well, you'll be accepted. He's giving him the answer. Cain should have gotten into fellowship with the Lord and had conversation with him and said, God, what should I do to do well according to your standards? So pride kicked in because he thought he was doing well according to his own standards. So he should have asked, like, Lord, why wasn't my offering acceptable to you? Like, what can I do? What can I change? Isolation and alienation happens in this as well because had he listened to God, he wouldn't have done what he's about to do in the next verse. So verse 8 it says, Now Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. So this right here is deeper sin. His first thing was not listening to God when God tried to encourage him, walking away, just trying to do things in his own strength. So he goes and he kills his brother. And instead of consulting God, he took matters, again, into his own hands. Verse 9, Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel, your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? Now listen. I come from a Hispanic household. You talk like that to anybody. <laughs> so when I read that, I was like, Whoa. but what do we what do we see there? There's no conviction for sin. He's just like, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? He's fallen so deep into this that he kills his own brother. And then when God asks him, he gives him an opportunity. He just has this attitude like he does not care. Verse 10. And he said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. So now you are cursed from the earth, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you till the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. A fugitive in a bag of iron, you shall be on the earth. Verse 13, and Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Surely you have driven me out this day from the face of the ground. I shall be hidden from your face. I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond on the earth. And it will happen that anyone who finds me will kill me. He literally put it, and he's trying to put like a, a curse over himself. But why did it have to go that far for him to, to start to realize like, oh my God, this is really bad. And then in verse 15, we see, and the Lord said to him, therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark on Cain, lest anyone finding him should kill him. Even after all of this, God still protects him. And we see God's mercy and his protection. When we sin, there's always there's going to be a consequence. But God is still protecting him. Because he's just like, whoever finds me is going to kill me. He's like, no, 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 no. Nobody's going to touch you. I'm going to put a mark around you. And if somebody tries to kill you or kills you, the curse is going to be seven times worse over them. So God's still saying like, son, I love you. Yes, you messed up. And here's the consequence. But I still have you. I still want to protect you in all of this. And I, when I saw that in the story of Cain and Abel, it really just blew my mind because you see the signs of a prodigal heart, but you still see God be God, right? right. Still loving and protecting. Now we're going to go to Luke 15. Because we can't do the prodigal heart without talking about the prodigal son. And as you go to Luke 15, you know, just, just know that the issue starts in the heart. Right, our heart is so sensitive. I don't know about y'all, but some, I can be happy one moment and then sad the next. Like I could just go up and down. I can, my feelings can get hurt very easily, right? Our heart is so sensitive, but that's why the Bible tells us to guard our heart. And even physically, our heart is the most important, most powerful, yet most sensitive organ of our body. If the heart stops, everything else starts to shut down, right? Any other organ in your body, if your kidneys stop working properly, Right? I, I remember years ago, my kidneys weren't functioning fully, so all the other organs started kicking in to try to make up for that. But once your heart stops, everything starts to shut down. And, and that just goes to show you how sensitive yet powerful it is. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. Had Cain considered that, if he would have trusted in the Lord with all his heart, if he would have listened to what God told him, if he would have gone to him in prayer and asked him, like, what can I do that's better? He would have never gotten into all of that mess. So now we are in Luke 15. Are we there? Okay. Anybody else need a Bible that we missed? If you raise your hand. Okay. Oh, we need, we need one more Bible. Okay, Luke 15. We've read the story of the prodigal son. 
But there's something that runs really, really deep with this parable that blessed me. So we're going to start at verse 11. So Luke 15, 11. Then he said, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. What do we see here? We see number one, entitlement and pride. He's like, give me my money. You're not supposed to get inheritance until the person dies. But he's just like, give it to me now. Like, I don't, I'm not waiting for you to die. So the father divided to them his livelihood. Verse 13, and not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and journeyed to a far country. What do we see there? Isolation and alienation. He has entitlement and pride. He says, give me the money. He gets the money. Now he leaves the country. And then it says, and there he wasted his possessions with prodigal living. There's no conviction for sin. He's just doing his own thing. He's like, give me the money. He leaves the country. Later on, we're going to see that he, he spent the money on prostitutes and harlots and all of that. There's no conviction for sin here. Verse 14. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land. I want you to circle or write down the word famine because we're going to come back to this. And he began to be in one. In verse 15. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. What do we see here? We see deeper sin. Jewish people were not allowed to be in contact with pigs. You don't eat them. You don't touch them. It's Levitical law will, will show you that. So he's going into deeper sin because he's so desperate to try to get work. So now he's taking a job to feed swine. He never should have even been in that country to begin with. Now, the most beautiful thing that we see that the Lord did was the Lord brought a famine. And we're going to see what happens as a result of that. So in verse 16, it says, And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. Nobody cared. He, he's in a country. He doesn't know who these people are. It said he, he uh, connected himself with a citizen of the country. He got this job to feed the pigs. He's hungry. He doesn't know anybody because he isolated himself. He alienated where he was from. Verse 17, but when he came to himself, circle that. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare? And I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. And I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants servants. Sin will blur your vision. And in verse 17, he starts to come to his senses like, what am I doing? Why am I here? And we, uh, listen, I can tell you, there have been situations where I was so deep in the sin. It's almost like, it's like all of a sudden you can see him like, oh my God, what am I doing? How did I get here? It's almost like you, you're covered in mud and you're just so dirty. And you're just like, how did I even end up in this situation? Verse 20, and he arose and came to his father but when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight and am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For my son was dead and is alive again for he was lost and is found and they began to be married. The most beautiful thing that God did in this was he brought a famine because if there was no famine, he wouldn't have become that hungry. He wouldn't have ended up in this pigsty that he was in. He wouldn't have come to his senses. And when we go into this prodigal mindset, whether it's our heart or like physically walking away, God will bring a famine. You could lose your job. Your marriage could start falling apart. You, whatever it is, God brings a famine. And, and in a moment of being a prodigal, you can kind of get, I've done this, I get in a whiny position like, God, why? This is already happening, and then this is happening, and the whole time he's just like, I'm trying to get your attention. Had God not sent the famine, he probably would have stayed there longer. Who knows what else would have happened? But the famine was really a gift to get him out. That was his way out of there. Before you start in Luke 15 and the story of the prodigal, verse 10 says, Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repents. Now, there's a plot twist here. I always say this is a parable of the prodigal sons because the elder brother has a prodigal heart. 
and we're going to see a different type of prodigal. So if we go on to verse 25, we're going to read right here in 25. It says, now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come, and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatty cat. But he was angry and would not go in. Well, here comes the entitlement and the pride. And he's literally going to say it. Therefore, his father came out and pleaded with him. Pleaded. He didn't just come out and tell him, like, get in the house. He pleaded with him to come in. Verse 29, so he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment at any time, and yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours came, he's just like, as soon as your son came. Do you see the attitude? Do you see the pride coming in here? But as soon as this son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. Verse 31, and he said to him, son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again, and was lost and is found. God is basically saying to him, you have all that you need right here with me. And he's not considering everything that this younger brother went through. Right? He's not considering his moment in the pigsty. He has to realize that he messed up. He has to come home and repent. That's a lot. So he's just like, he goes, he messes up, he takes all the money, he spends it on harlots, and you throw him a party? But he's saying, no, 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 we're throwing him a party because he came back, came back to me, he repented, he's walking with me again. I saw this quote, it's by John Ortberg, and I thought this was beautiful. It says, one of the hardest things in the world is to stop being the prodigal son without turning into the elder brother. And I thought, I was like, whoa, that one hit me because do you see the difference between the two? You have the one that physically leaves, but then you have the one who's doing everything they're supposed to do, and his heart is really off. And I think we can find ourselves at any point in our walk, we can fall into either of those. So now, let's see. We're going to talk about the three remedies for a prodigal heart. They all begin with the letter R. I didn't plan that one, but I just figured it's easy. So number one, revelation of our pigsty. We have to see our circumstances as God sees it. And one of the reasons why we stay in a prodigal state is because we don't see it the way God sees it. We, sees it. we see it like, oh, this is great. Oh, I'm in this relationship, and this is wonderful, and he loves me. But it's like, no, you're living in sin. That's not who God wants you with. They're not a believer, so you're unequally yoked, right? We can be living in this thing, seeing it our way, but the moment that we see it the way God sees it, that can change everything. So first, we need a revelation of our pigsty. And you can ask God to show you what he sees. And I promise you're going to find yourself repenting quickly because he's going to show you how ugly it is. Have you ever prayed and said, God, I need you to show me what you see in this situation? I've done that. And I was like on my face crying, like, oh, my God. It's just like all of a sudden you can see everything. Number two, repentance. You can't repent until you have a revelation of how bad it is, yeah. right? So you need to see what God sees and how it goes against his word. Then we have repentance. Now, repentance isn't just saying, I'm sorry, God, tears. You know, that doesn't mean that you're actually repenting. And here's what I always tell people. Here's God. Here's the devil. I cannot face both at the same time. So if I'm a prodigal and I'm walking this way, my back is to God. And sometimes what we do, because I've learned this, here's God, here's the devil, I'm like right here. Sorry, cue the tears, and then I go back, right? So repentance means I turn my back on the enemy, I turn my back on that <coughs> sin, and I come back to God and I say, okay, here I am. That's what repentance is. And if you need help getting out of that sin, because we've all struggled with sin, ask them for help. Say, God, what do I do? Can you help me in this area? A good practice for repentance is not to just say I'm sorry to God, but explain why you're sorry. Right? Do you ever have that? I, I do this with my niece. She'll be like, I'm sorry. I'll be like, why are you sorry? Not to, not to make her feel bad, but I want her to learn how to articulate. 
I'm sorry because I shouldn't have done that because whatever. Explain to God, why are you sorry? How does that go against his word? Right? I'm sorry, God, that I had a bitter heart because nobody came and helped me serve at this event. Right? You said in your word that there's going to be many who are called and very few who are going to actually listen to that call. There's not going to be enough people to help. Right? So you already said this. You already told us. So understanding to say, explain why you're sorry and even ask him, how do I stop doing this? Or Lord, you know what? I shouldn't be in that situation. I shouldn't be partying and drinking and getting drunk every weekend. I'm no longer going to hang with those friends because they lead me into sin. Whatever it is, having that real honest conversation with God. Number three, revelation of God and his love. So first was revelation of our pigsty, then repentance, revelation of God and his love is number three. Hebrews 13, five says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. That is a promise from God. He has never left you, he's never forsaken you. Jeremiah 33, three. No, I mean, every time I say this verse, I think of you because we both, we know this one. It says, call to me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. You don't understand something, call to God. He says, call to me, I will answer you. I will show you the things you don't understand. Sometimes he's going to withhold something because he doesn't, maybe it's too much. Have you ever had that where you're just like, this might be too much for me to know. But go to him because he knows all. But how we view God matters. And some people get stuck in this prodigal life because their perspective of God is based on their human, physical family members. Your father, your mother, your aunt, your uncles, whoever's in your life, you view God in that perspective. But make sure that you view God, that your view of God aligns with his word and not with your wounds. Because that is why many people don't come back to God. Or they think they're back, but they just kind of have like their arm like this. Like, here I am, I'm serving, I'm reading the word, but you can't get that close. Because there's certain parts of our heart that we don't let him in. So make sure that your view of God aligns with his word and not with your wounds. Okay. So... Whenever I do a teaching, I always ask God, I'm like, all right, what do you want to do? Do you want to do slides? Do we need a photo for like visual, a guy? Not that he needs my help with these things. But this time he said, I want to write a letter to my daughters. So I want you all to close your eyes. I'm going to try not to cry because this, this really blessed me. It's a poem that he put on my heart and I wrote it out. And so I'm going to read it to you. So close your eyes. It's called My Daughter, My Princess. My daughter, my princess, I hear your cries. I know the truth, don't believe the lies. The enemy is trying to pull you away. So you search for things that'll lead you astray. My daughter, my princess, do not lose hope. I hear all your prayers, I hear every groan. I know you are tired and want to give up. But I, the Lord, will fill your cup. To the mother whose child is running from me now, keep praying and have faith. It'll work out somehow. To the wife who feels alone and unsure of what to do, I can soften hearts and make all things new. To the woman who desires to be a mother soon, remember, I bring life. I can open your womb. My daughter, my princess, do not run from me today. Come back into my arms so you can hear what I say. I formed you in the womb. All your hairs are numbered. I, the living God, neither sleep nor slumber. I will never forsake you or leave you behind. My daughter, my princess, you will always be mine. And he put that on my heart because be prodigals and not know it. So I want to encourage you, get before the Lord and ask him, Lord, is my heart off? Sometimes you think that you are running and doing the best thing. You could be doing the best work for the Lord. You can be filling out stadiums, doing whatever, and you could still be a prodigal. So I just want to encourage you, this really blessed me, 
It's not to make you feel beat up. It's just to let you know that even Cain who killed his brother, the Lord still protected him, right? Even the prodigal who ran and used all the money on harlots, he came back and repented and the father ran towards him. Even the one whose heart was off the elder brother, he pleaded with him to come back. So I just want to encourage you, trust God in this. You know, the, the days, oh, they're getting dark. And I don't know about y'all, but it's getting harder. Yeah. I'm noticing it's getting harder for me to focus on the word. It's getting harder for me to get up and pray. It's and I just realized like the enemy is attacking hard. So I have to fight harder. But, you know, Pastor Aaron always says, there's that reset button. You just every day. Some days you're just going to be like, you know what? Every five seconds I need to hit this button because I messed it up. But allow the Lord to just guide you on all of this, whatever you're doing. You know, if you're serving and you're frustrated, I know for those of us who serve, and there's times where you don't have enough help. Maybe that's why that could be your famine. God's like, no, 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 there's something I want to talk to you about. So just be encouraged by that. So now we're going to